1990s, console RPGs largely followed a specific, predefined formula. They were usually set in a fantasy environment, and had epic stories with evil empires and heroes that defied the odds. Not so with Earthbound, which was released on the SNES in 1995. Known as Mother 2 in Japan, the title deliberately dropped most RPG cliches and provided instead a unique, modern experience. Though not an immediate success, Earthbound developed an incredible fan base that praised the game for its unique setting, humorous dialogue, memorable music, and a huge array of comedic moments. One aspect of the game that goes overlooked, though, is the story. To bring it to light, this video will provide a complete, concise storyline explanation for the entirety of the game. The basis for this will be official canon and actual game footage. And now, let's get into the tale. It is the year 1990X. In a small town called Onet, in the country of Eagle Land, a boy named Ness sleeps soundly. However, he awakens in the dead of night to a loud noise and immediately sets out to investigate after talking with his mother. Outside, police block the entrance to town, but people nearby speak of a meteorite crash. Ness finds that his next door neighbor, Pokey, left his house to chase a police car. Ness heads through the trail to a nearby hilltop. When he arrives, police inform him that Pokey has been pestering them. Pokey tells Ness to go home and that he will tell him more about the meteorite the next day. Ness goes back to his home and after talking to his mother, he falls asleep again. After some time, he is abruptly woken up again by knocking on his front door. When he checks it, he finds Pokey who says that his brother Picky is missing. Apparently, the police suddenly left the meteorite to deal with sharks, a local gang. As they did so, Pokey noticed his brother was missing. Ness and his dog join Pokey to leave in search of Picky. After fighting their way through enemies, Ness and Pokey make it to the hilltop. The meteorite is smoldering, but Picky is sitting nearby under a tree. After he joins the party, they walk past the meteorite again. This time, however, a bee named Buzz Buzz emerges from a beam of light. He says that he is from 10 years in the future, where all is devastation. There, a universal cosmic destroyer named Gygus has plunged the world into eternal darkness. According to Buzz Buzz, an ancient prophecy foretells of a boy who is destined to shatter a nightmare rock and reveal a path of light. He adds that three boys and a girl will join together and defeat Gygus. Buzz Buzz joins the group and they all head home. Just as they approach, a star man appears and demands that Buzz Buzz give up his attempt to foil Gygus' plans. After the group defeats him in battle, Buzz Buzz warns that Ness will have to fight enemies sent by Gygus and explains that animals have also become violent due to his evil influence. After Pokey and Picky return home, Pokey's mother swats Buzz Buzz as he swarms around her hair. As he dies, he implores Ness to begin his adventure to stop Gygus. He says to defeat the Destroyer, he will have to unite his powers with the Earths. To do this, he will have to visit eight special sanctuaries, the first of which is Giant Step near Onet. Before he fades away, Buzz Buzz gives Ness a soundstone to record melodies at each sanctuary location. After his father deposits some money into his account, and he talks to his mother, Ness sets out on his adventure. He soon learns that the local billboard guy has excavated a glowing golden statue, and says he intends to continue digging for additional treasure. On his way to Giant Step, Ness discovers that Onet City Hall has locked the door and prevented entry to the touring entertainer's shack because a punk named Frank trashed it. Apparently, the Sharks gang has been causing trouble all over Onet. Ness fights his way through some of these ruffians in the local arcade and eventually finds Frank outside. He attacks, but Ness is able to use his skills to defeat him and his tank, the Frankie Stein Mark II. Frank then admits defeat and tells Ness that a special power is stored in Giant Step. He adds that Perkle, the mayor of Onet, has a key to the shack. At Town Hall, Ness meets Perkle, who is ecstatic that the boy has effectively subdued the sharks. In return for his deed, he hands over the key to the shack. With the key, he enters the passageway to Giant Step. Making his way through enemies that have infested the location, he eventually finds himself confronted by the titanic Ant, who is guarding the sanctuary location. After he's defeated, Ness reaches the hilltop, where he encounters a giant footprint. In that moment, Ness catches a glimpse of a small, cute puppy, and the soundstone records the melody of Giant Step. When he returns to town, police scold him for entering inside the area because the location was closed. Ness spends the night at his house, where he hears the voice of a girl named Paula calling out to him. At police headquarters, he finds that the road to Tucson is also blocked because of an emergency, but police captain Strong commands him to follow him into another room. 
he intends to test Ness by making him face five of his strongest police officers. Though they talk trash and become bitter in defeat, Ness overcomes four of them, and the fifth officer runs off and says he's going to call his boss. The captain threatens to use his super ultra mambo tango foxtrot martial arts, but is soundly defeated as well. Afterward, he radios his staff to open the road to Tucson for Ness. He then passes the previously blocked road and makes his way to Tucson on foot. When he gets into town, he learns that a musical group called the Runaway Five is extremely popular. They play at the local Chaos Theater and owe its owner, Mr. Poochie Fudd, a large sum of money. As Ness approaches the west side of Berglund Park, a hustler named Everdread jumps off the roof of his house and attacks the boy on sight. When he's defeated, he makes an excuse that his loss was due to a twisted ankle he suffered jumping from his house. Additionally, he reveals that a local girl named Paula has been kidnapped by a chubby boy and a weird guy in a blue outfit, and is being held in a secret hideout in the peaceful Rest Valley. As it turns out, much of Tucson has come under the influence of Happy Happyism, a religious movement. Everdread claims that Paula is to be used by the group as a human sacrifice and that he should return to him if he's able to rescue her. Nearby, Paula's mother runs a preschool in town. She says not to worry about her daughter, as she has a guardian angel. He also discovers that Paula has psychic powers and knows that a boy named Ness is trying to reach her. Tucson is also home to two inventors, Apple Kid and Orange Kid, who live next door to each other. Both are in financial distress, so Ness gives $200 to both inventors. For doing so, Orange Kid gives Ness the Super Orange Machine, or the Suporma. According to him, it can be used to spread peace and goodwill on Earth. On his way to Happy Happy Village to find Paula, Ness heads through Peaceful Rest Valley. He's stopped from proceeding through by an iron statue shaped like a pencil. Shortly afterward, Apple Kid alerts him that he's finished work on a great invention and to meet him in Berglund Park. When he does so, he presents Ness with the pencil eraser, which removes all pencil-shaped figures. With the invention in hand, Ness is able to eliminate the iron pencil standing in his way in Peaceful Rest Valley. When he arrives into town, he finds that the area is taken over by followers of the Happy Happy religion. According to some of its adherents, the leader of the cult, Carpainter, is extremely charismatic. Followers of the cult wear blue, convinced that it's the color of peace. After passing through a cave north of town and fighting his way through Happy Happy cultists, Ness finds Paula locked inside a cabin. She says she had a premonition that he would come to save her, but says that only Carpenter has the key to her cell. Because Carpenter can command the power of lightning, she gives Ness the Franklin badge to ward against it. Outside the cabin, Ness surprisingly runs into Pokey again. He says that Carpenter has made him an important figure in Happy Happyism. He then runs off, but leaves Ness to fight additional cultists. The Happy Happy headquarters is swarming with followers of the cult, but Ness pushes his way through them to reach Carpenter. When he's confronted, he says he needs Ness's assistance to make the world blue and asks him to become his assistant. When he refuses, he attempts to unleash his lightning powers upon the boy, but the Franklin badge reflects it. After Ness defeats him in combat, he admits that he's been acting peculiar ever since he obtained the Mani Mani statue behind him. He apologizes for his actions and gives Ness the key to the mountain cabin. Afterward, the Happy Happy cult has been disbanded, and all is normal in the town. Pokey also pleads with Ness to be friends with him again, but before he can answer, admits his insincerity and runs off again. With the key, Ness returns to the mountain cabin and unlocks Paula's cell. She agrees to join Ness and says that they can overcome many challenges by combining their strength. Traveling through the cave to the east, they fight various enemies. At the end of the cave, they are confronted by Mondo Mole, who is guarding the second sanctuary location. After he is subdued, they step outside the cavern to find a series of footprints. There, Ness has a vision of a baby in a red cap, and the soundstone records the melody of the Lilliput Steps. When Ness and Paula return to Tucson, Paula's mother is thankful of her safety, and gives her the hand aid. Paula's father thanks Ness for saving her, and allows her to accompany him in his quest to save the world. Back in Berglund Park, Everdread hands Ness $10,000 in the form of a wad of bills. The hustler says he plans on looking for the evil Mani Mani statue that Liar Exaggerate unearthed in Onet. 
For returning Paula, The Runaway Five presents Nest with a backstage pass to their upcoming show at Chaos Theater. After talking with the band, the group steps onto the stage and puts on an incredible performance. Ness hands the club owner, Mr. Poochie Fudd, the wad of bills to pay off the Runaway Five's debts. Now free to tour as they please, the group is ecstatic. In return for Ness's generosity, they agree to take him and Paula to three. After scraping the sidewalk, they head there in their tour bus. As they drop the two off, they say that their next gig is at a theater in Foreside. Unfortunately for the two new friends, Threed is infested with zombies working for Master Belch, a servant of Gygus. Most of the villagers have locked themselves in their homes in distress, but some are congregating near the circus in the middle of town. After observing two zombies near the town's graveyard, Ness and Paula are lured inside the hotel by a mysterious woman. There, they're ambushed by zombies. When they awaken, they find themselves in a small dungy room with a locked door. Just then, Paula uses her telepathic abilities to reach out to a boy named Jeff. In Winters, a small country to the north, Jeff awakens from his sleep in Snowwood Boarding House to hear Paula's voice. In response to her plea for help, Jeff leaves his room despite his intent to violate the dorm rules and is accompanied by his friend Tony. With the help of Maxwell's machine that opens doors, especially when you have a slightly bad key, Jeff retrieves some tools for his impending adventure. Using Tony for leverage, Jeff climbs over the boarding house fence and says goodbye to his friend. Just after setting out to find Ness and Paula, he recruits Bubble Monkey to accompany him. He then ventures through Winters, and after spending a night in a tent, he witnesses an appearance of the legendary sea creature Tessie. With Bubble Monkey's help, Jeff rides Tessie as it swims southward. After making his way through a dungeon designed by Brick Road, Jeff passes Stonehenge and arrives at the lab of his scientist father, Dr. Andonitz. He says his son can use his nearby invention, the Skyrunner, to reach his future friends. Jeff steps inside, and after pressing a button on the controller, the machine launches him through the roof. It flies over many locations, eventually crashing through the graveyard in three. There, Jeff emerges from his machine to find Ness and Paula standing before him. Now joined by their nearsighted friend, the three escape the room with Jeff's bad key machine. In town, they confront the boogie tent. After putting an end to it, they retrieve a jar of fly honey by a garbage can underneath it. Soon afterward, Apple Kid contacts Ness by way of the receiver phone. He says that he's recently finished a new invention, the zombie paper. Using a pizza delivery man for his own ends, he has it delivered to the adventurers. Ness places the zombie paper on the floor of the Zombie Relief Corps headquarters, and the group spends a night at the hotel. Overnight, three zombies are attracted to the paper and leave their positions to converge upon the tent. The next morning, all the zombies are stuck to the floor. Now able to enter the secret passageway near the graveyard, they make their way to Saturn Valley, the home of Mr. Saturn's. The group finds out that the inhabitants of Saturn Valley are being taken behind the nearby Grapefruit Falls for reasons unknown. The three travel there, where they wait until they're allowed to enter into Master Belch's Fly Honey Factory. As it turns out, the Mr. Saturns are being enslaved to produce Fly Honey, the evildoer's favorite snack. Fighting their way through his acolytes, they eventually reach Master Belch himself. After burping loudly, he admits knowing that there is a prophecy that a boy will defeat Gygus. When he is defeated in combat, he adds that Gygus has managed to get the Mani Mani statue into Foreside. With the Mr. Saturns liberated, Ness, Paula, and Jeff are treated as friends in Saturn Valley. While sharing coffee with them, they learn that many challenges await. Afterward, they proceed to the third sanctuary location, north of Saturn Valley. Inside, they're tested by the Trillion Age Sprout. After it's vanquished, the group steps out of the cavern to a nearby spring. Ness hears the voice of his mother from far away, and the soundstone records the melody of the Milky Well. Leaving Saturn Valley, Ness and his friends head back to Threed, where the zombies are gone and the youngsters are treated as heroes. With the ghosts cleared from the tunnel, the adventurers use the local bus to travel to Foreside. On the way though, the bus is stopped by a traffic jam in the Dusty Dunes Desert. On foot, they head east through the tunnel and into Foreside. In the city, Ness and his friends discover that Geldegarde Monatoli, the mayor of Foreside, has consolidated immense power and built a huge tower for himself. Inside, they learn that Pokey has been appointed as the mayor's advisor and right-hand man. He orders security to remove Ness and his friends. When they enter Topola Theater, they use their backstage pass to meet the Runaway Five again. They quickly learn that the band is in financial trouble yet again and owe a million dollars to the owner of the theater. 
Ness and his friends witness yet another amazing performance and exit the building. An excavator named Gerardo Montague begins digging for gold in the Dusty Dunes desert, but the cavern is filled with monsters. The team makes quick work of them, and deeper inside are stopped by a series of five mole masters. After defeating each one, the digger is able to continue his work. On the way back to Forsyth, Gerardo's brother stops the bus and gives Ness and his friends a diamond they found inside. They hand it to the owner of the Topola Theater to pay off the Runaway Five's debts, and she agrees to rip up the band's contract with the venue. Freed from their financial bind yet again, the Runaway Five celebrates the assistance of Ness and his friends, giving them special thanks in their final show at the theater. In the local department store, the lights are abruptly turned off. Suddenly, a monster swoops in and kidnaps Paula. Right afterward, the intercom instructs Ness to proceed to the office on the fourth floor. When he does so, Ness and Jeff are threatened by an alien, the department store spook, and attacked. When he is beaten, he promises that Master Gygus will avenge him. Before he fades away, he implies that Paula is in the hands of Mayor Monatoli. Outside the cafe, Everdread from Tucson is lying on the street. Recognizing Ness, he says that he obtained the Mani Mani statue he was looking for, but Monatoli tricked him and stole it. As it turns out, he tried to have Everdread killed to conceal the fact that his power comes from the statue. He tells Ness to search behind the counter in the cafe, and leaves the area. After searching behind the counter, the color scheme of the world shifts, and Forside becomes Moonside, an alternative psychic reality. Enemies roam the streets, and the inhabitants are consumed by madness. In front of the Monatoli Tower, Ness and Jeff discover the evil Mani Mani statue. It attacks them, but is soon overwhelmed. Afterward, the statue lies crushed in a storage room, and Ness learns that Moonside was merely an illusion it created. As they emerge from the cafe, Applekin informs Ness that he has finished his latest invention, the Gourmet Yogurt Machine. He says that he'll have it delivered via Escargo Express, neglected class. When the delivery man appears, he says that he forgot the package, but thinks he left it in the desert. Coincidentally, Mayor Monatoli's assistant overhears their conversation, and says she's looking for trout-flavored yogurt the machine can make, so it can be served to a special guest. Ness and Jeff brave the desert once more to find the mentor of the monkeys. After fighting their way through enemies, and exchanging items with the monkeys in return for safe passage, the two meet Tala Rama. After sharing his philosophy with the group, he says that four great powers will gather to bring peace back to the world. He gives the group the yogurt dispenser they came searching for. In addition, they learn the skill of teleportation from the monkey nearby. With their new power, the team can quickly travel to any location they have visited previously. Back in Forside, Monatoli's assistant takes the yogurt dispenser and tells Ness to drop by her room on the 48th floor of the tower. There, the assistant gives the team the trout-flavored yogurt the machine created. Outside of her room, they are attacked by the clumsy robot. Just as they are fighting it, the Runaway 5 burst onto the scene. They turn it off by its switch, and the adversary stops moving. The group says they wanted to repay Ness for all he's done, and offer to help break into the next room. Inside, Paula greets Ness and says she is fine. Mayor Monatoli says he was only influenced to do nefarious deeds because of the Mani Mani statue. He apologizes for taking Paula, and she rejoins the group. Before they all leave the tower, the mayor says that the statue attracts evil spirits and weakens one's heart, which is why he hid it behind the cafe. His cryptic visions imply that the group of friends should make their way to Summers. As they step onto the balcony of the tower, Monatoli's yellow helicopter lifts off. Pokey, who has escaped in the nick of time, berates the three. After calling Ness a world-class loser, he flies off. With their psychic powers, Paula realizes that the group must go back to three to get to Summers. Thankfully, the Runaway Five agree to take them there in their tour bus. As they walk out of the tower, Apple Kid calls again. To defeat Gygus, he says that a machine called the Phase Distorter must be invented. To do so, he says he must recruit the help of Dr. Andonitz. Ness and his friends leave Forsyth in the bus, and they all arrive in Threed. Back in the graveyard, they revisit the Skyrunner. Threed citizens have helped rebuild the invention, but it won't start. After inspecting it, Jeff deduces that he will be able to fix it. After he completes the repair, he says the contraption can be used to fly to Winters, where Jeff hopes it can be modified to go to Summers. It lifts into the air, sending the adventurers back into the sky into the lab of Dr. Andonitz. After admitting that Jeff wets the bed sometimes, the scientist says that the party should travel to the cave north of Stonehenge. When they get there, they enter the cave and fight through several enemies. Within, they are stopped by Shroom, the guardian of the fourth sanctuary location. 
when he is subdued, they step out into a pasture. In that moment, Ness catches a whiff of steak, and the soundstone records the melody of the rainy circle. Back at the lab, Jeff's father has finished remodeling the Skyrunner, which now has the ability to travel to Summers. Entering the machine once more, they fly there. The Skyrunner crashes into the beaches, destroying it completely. A seaside resort town, Summers is connected to the port village of Toto. The friends soon learn that Pokey recently passed by and spent tons of money. After they find the phone number for the exclusive Stoic Club, the group places a reservation. When they enter inside, they find members of the club eating magic cake made by the woman by the entrance. When the three step out onto the beach again, they express interest in trying the magical cake. When they try it, Ness has a vivid dream of the land of Dalam in the Far East. There, a prince named Pooh is in the process of strict martial arts training. He is instructed to go to the place of emptiness where he is to endure his final test. After taking the treasures of Dalam, he sets up for the location. At Mu, the place of emptiness, Pooh begins to meditate. Though he's tempted to stop, he's confronted by the spirit of his ancient lineage. After having his legs, arms, ears, and eyes taken away, he completes his training. Returning to the palace, he is congratulated by his master. He is also warned of the threat of Gygus and his attempt to control all wickedness. To challenge his evil, Pooh learns that he's destined to join Ness to overcome the danger. After learning the power of teleportation, Pooh sends himself to Summers, where he introduces himself and joins the group. In the Scaraba Cultural Museum, Pooh hands the curator his tiny ruby. Because of his deed, the group of friends is allowed into the second floor. Pooh reads the hieroglyphs on the stone inside, which reveals the secret of the pyramid in Scaraba. Armed with a proper understanding of the clues, they take a picture of the hieroglyph with them. Back at the Dinosaur Museum in Forside, the curator says he'll reveal an extraordinary discovery if the group can get him the autograph of Venus, the new singer at Topola Theater. With their connections to the Runaway Five, they get backstage again and obtain her autograph on a banana peel. After receiving it, the curator says he found a huge rat in the sewers beneath the next room. Deep inside, they find that the Plague Rat of Doom is guarding the Fifth Sanctuary location. When he is defeated, they climb the ladder and get into an outdoor area. There, Ness has a vision of a baby's bottle, and the soundstone records the melody of Magnet Hill. They also find a carrot key nearby. After teleporting to Dalam, the friends use the key on the rabbit statues next to the previously blocked passage. Inside, they make their way through the cavern and are eventually confronted by thunder and storm. After overcoming it, they step out onto a cloud in the sky. Ness has a vision of his mother when she was young, and the soundstone records the melody of the pink cloud. Back in Summers, the team enlists the help of a local to sail across the sea to Skaraba. After they board, they quickly leave the port. Just as the ship nears the shores, a giant sea creature, Kraken, approaches. Thankfully, Ness and his party are able to put an end to the beast. The captain is extremely impressed and says he contributed to the monster's downfall by throwing his slippers at it. In the desert town of Skaraba, the group searches for a way to unlock the secrets they read about in the hieroglyph. As they leave town, they come across a giant sphinx next to a firmly sealed pyramid. After walking in a star pattern, the group is instructed by the sphinx to enter into the previously locked area and search for the Hawkeye. In the depths of the structure, they reach a room with a casket on a pedestal. After finding a hidden switch, they enter into the secret hole underneath. In the room below, they find the Hawkeye on top of a platform. Outside, a Star Master approaches in the form of a tornado and tells Pooh it is time for him to learn the way of Star Storm. To do so, he must live away from his friends for a while, so he departs from the group. A villager gives Ness and his friends a key to the tower to the northwest. They soon arrive at the structure, which is shaped as a giant being of some sort. When they enter inside, a sign tells them that they are inside the body of Brick Road, the same dungeon designer Jeff encountered earlier. After reading additional messages he has left behind, they circumvent the labyrinth and find the face of Brick Road in the wall. He offers to join the party for a while and guides the group to the return hole. When they leave, the giant structure follows them and gets stuck in palm trees. However, Brick Road says he has a submarine in his old vehicle collection. At the back of the dungeon, Ness and his friends find it, and Jeff makes some repairs. With the submarine, the young adventurers make their way to deep darkness, a path leading under the earth. In the nearby swamp, they come across Master Belch again. After reminding the team of his ripe odor, he says he's changed his name to Puke. He then attacks. To their surprise, Pooh returns to the party during the fight and unleashes his new Star Storm attack. With Master Barf defeated, they wade through the murky waters and enter a cave. Inside, they stumble upon Tenda Village, 
which is populated by shy green inhabitants. Applicate calls to inform the team that he's working on the eraser eraser machine at the lab of Dr. Andonitz. Just as he's explaining this, he panics as if something is awry and the call is disconnected. Orange Kid calls immediately afterward, saying he hoped to borrow a book called Overcoming Shyness, but Applicate has disappeared. At the lab in Winners, Applicate's mouse says his master was kidnapped, but he left behind the eraser eraser machine for the crew. With a contraption, they erase the statue under Stonehenge and proceed through the tunnel. In the depths, they discover a secret Starman base. Inside, they find their friends captured and placed in test tubes. In the next room, Starman Deluxe says that Ness and his friends have proven to be stronger than they estimated. He threatens the team and attacks. When he's destroyed, the structure begins to shake and the Stonehenge base ceases to function. In the next room, the friends of the group are now freed from imprisonment, and Mr. Saturn, Dr. Andonitz, Tony, and the others express their thanks. Applekid says he calculated that there was a very small chance he would be rescued, and adds that he returned the Overcoming Shyness book to the Onet Library. When they venture there, they find the book on the shelf. When it is brought to tend a village, Ness and company give it to the villagers. The leader reads the book to all the inhabitants to help them overcome their condition. In return, he gives Ness Tendakraut, their prized dish, and a bag of Dragonite. When they stop for a tea break, the group realizes it has grown in strength immensely, and everyone has supported each other as friends. They are also reminded that Gygus is still searching for ways to end their journey, but that they should still persevere. After overcoming their shyness, a villager in Tenda uses his newfound strength to lift a giant boulder. After it's moved, they find passage into the Lost Underworld. A talking rock gives them direction, and they eventually make their way through the cavern. At the end, they are stopped by the Electro Spectre, the guardian of the Seventh Sanctuary location. When it's defeated, they step into an electronic world where their thoughts are scrolling along the wall. Ness has a vision of his father holding him, and the soundstone records the melody of Lumine Hall. After exiting the area, they find themselves in a strange world. At first, they appear in a prehistoric area where they are tiny in comparison to all their surroundings. After defeating some dinosaurs, they find a group of Tendas and give them Tendakraut. The mystery rock nearby informs them that the universe hinges upon Ness's destiny to defeat Gygus. He says that the last sanctuary location, Fire Spring, is located to the southwest. The party enters the area and uses their skills to navigate through its depths. At its end is Carbon Dog, the shape-shifting guardian of the eighth and final sanctuary location. When he is made tame, Ness and his friends find their way to the volcanic source of the lava. Ness has a vision of himself as a baby, and the soundstone records the melody of the fire spring. Now that the soundstone has recorded all eight melodies, Ness has a dream. Within, he enters a home and observes the moment in which he was named by his parents. Suddenly, he's sent to Magicant, a dream world that reflects both warm and violent aspects of himself. In the dream world, there are many characters from Ness's past. At one point, he even sees his younger self. In a nearby building, a bird-like creature called Flying Man joins the group. Ness and his dream friend wander through the land, eventually making their way through a swamp. He reaches Ness's nightmare, the glowing Mani Mani statue that represents the evil part of his brain. He attacks, but Ness is able to defeat it. He soon hears a familiar voice coming from the middle of the Sea of Eden. He is warned that everything could be destroyed by Gygus, but that Ness will prevent him from doing so. He's then directed back to Saturn Valley where he's told he will get something new. After transcending his fears, Ness grows greatly in strength. His mind clears and Magicant is no more. After having visions of each of the eight sanctuary locations, he awakens with his friends and the soundstone has disappeared. They return to Saturn Valley where Dr. Andonitz, Mr. Saturn, and Applekid have been working on the phase distorter. However, a prototype of the invention was recently stolen. It was taken by someone resembling a pig wearing clothes who also kidnapped Mr. Saturn. As it stands, the phase distorter is dysfunctional. To fix it, Dr. Andonitz says the team must seek out a piece of a meteorite so he can synthesize the material Zexanite. Remembering the meteorite that fell in Onet, the group heads there. Unfortunately, the town is now overrun by enemies. Ness stops at his home, where his mother says everyone has barricaded themselves in their homes. Regardless, Ness and his friends press forward and reach the landing site. There, they obtain a meteorite piece. Returning to Saturn Valley again, they hand it to Dr. Andonitz, who is able to use it to fix the phase distorter. After completing preparations, they board the invention, and it sends the team into a mysterious cave. 
There, a Starman teaches Pooh his final Starstorm ability. After just a few steps, Mr. Saturn is found next to the broken phase distorter. He says that his kidnapper has escaped to the past. Eventually, Dr. Andonitz and Apple Kid arrive, and they say that Gygus is attacking the world from many years in the past. To defeat him, the party learns that they must warp to the past via the Phase Distorter 3. However, because life is destroyed in the process of warping, the group must transfer their brain programs into robots that can carry out the mission. Dr. Andonitz says that he cannot promise that their spirits will come back after the battle in the past, but they agree to go nevertheless. Dr. Andonitz transfers their minds, and the group activates the Phase Distorter 3. In the past, the robotic friends fight their way through the cave again. Eventually, they reach an odd organic area. At the end of the passage, they see a vision of Ness poking through the wall. At that moment, Pokey appears in a space contraption. After berating the group, he says he will stop Ness from accomplishing his mission. With the direction of Gygus, Pokey has been directed to assist in making the monster the embodiment of evil itself. Pokey attacks the group in his heavily armed form. Though he is now powerful, the group manages to defeat him. In response, Pokey shuts off the Devil's Machine. In the process, the all-powerful Gygus is unleashed, trapping Ness and his friends in a chaotic dimension. Pokey says Gygus has destroyed his own mind with his incredible power. As they face off against the nebulous foe, Pokey returns in his vehicle to taunt the party once more, calling them pathetically weak heroes of so-called justice. When Gygus strikes again, his immense power overwhelms the group, and their attacks fail to affect him. Realizing this, Paula decides to pray, reaching out to the inhabitants of Earth. In the process, many of those the group has met along their journey come together and give their support. Dr. Andonitz, Apple Kid, and the inhabitants of Saturn Valley give their own thoughts to Ness and his friends. In Summers, the Runaway Five give the same prayer to the group. Those in the Polestar Preschool, including Paula's mother and father, reach out as well. Tony and the others at the Snowwood Boarding School also plead for the safety of the group. The people of Dalem gather together by the palace and give their own support as well. In Onet, Frank lends his thoughts to the cause. Ness's family awakens in the night to do the same. With the aid of all the people of the Earth, Gygus is undermined by his weakness, the power of human emotion. Pokey says he'll sneak away to another era and think about his next plan. Gygus vanishes from existence, no longer able to terrorize the world. The war against Gygus is now over. Though their robotic forms are incinerated, the spirits of Ness and his friends are successfully delivered back to the Earth. Saturn Valley celebrates their monumental accomplishment, though they all realize their travels together will now come to an end. Pooh uses his powers to return to Dala. Jeff says his goodbyes, glad that his theories helped the group. Dr. Andonitz, the Exit Mouse, and Apple Kid all congratulate them as well. After reading letters of support from all around the world, Ness escorts Paula back to Tucson, where they're both greeted as great heroes. Now that everything is peaceful, Ness returns home. He is greeted with a warm reception from his family, and views an album of photos taken of he and his friends throughout their journey as the credits roll. Afterward, Ness returns to his bed for the night. However, he is awakened by an eerily similar sounding knock at his door. When he opens it, Pokey's brother Picky appears again. He says he's received a letter from Pokey that was addressed to Ness. It says, come and get me, loser, spankity, spankity, spankity. As they all wonder where he is, the game comes to an end. If you remember Earthbound, leave a comment below about the most memorable aspect of the game to you. If you like my videos, please subscribe to my channel and click the bell below to be alerted upon the addition of new ones. Also, please consider supporting my channel via YouTube's join feature to receive member exclusives, such as advanced videos and complete video transcripts.